Storage Messenger self-storage webinar series. I'm Poppy Behrens, publisher, publisher of Minico Incorporated, and we're delighted to have you in the audience today. This is one of several informative webinars planned for self-storage owners, operators, managers, investors, developers, and other industry professionals. The sponsor of today's webinar is San Antonio-based Cross Metal Buildings, a Parham company. Our presenter is Donna May, president of Cross Metal Buildings. Donna has been in the self-storage industry since 1996 when she joined the Param Group team. She is the past president of Joshua Management. She is also a real estate broker and has a Bachelor of Arts degree in business. Donna has also been a partner in several startup self-storage projects. Recognized in Women in Self-Storage and Women in Construction, Donna has also been a contributing author, convention speaker, and a presenter for Learn Self-Storage. This year marks the 30th anniversary of Mini Storage Messenger, the original voice of the self-storage industry. Each issue of Messenger provides readers with in-depth news and information. Its cover stories and feature articles explore the most timely industry topics and trends. In addition to monthly columns contributed by industry experts and accomplished business professionals, our articles address a wide range of topics including security, facility operations, technology, legal issues, legislative updates, construction, and development. We also publish a variety of other self-storage data sources, such as the ones you see listed. For more information, please visit ministoragemessenger.com. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on demand from our archives at ministoragemessenger.com. We invite you to submit questions throughout today's webinar. To do so, simply type your question into the question area and click Send. While we will try and answer as many as we can during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar, those that cannot be answered due to time constraints will be answered by way of email once the webinar has been concluded. Today's presentation should run about 45 minutes, with the remainder of the hour open to questions and answers. And now it's my distinct pleasure to turn the presentation over to Donna. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, and thank you, Poppy. It's really a privilege for me to be working with the Mini Storage Messenger on this presentation uh, to help people who are new to the industry get a little bit better understanding about self-storage. And I would like to congratulate the Mini Storage Messenger on 30 years of service. That's really a great accomplishment. Thank you very much. You are welcome. What I'm going to be talking about today, uh, I'll be talking about from the perspective of if you were going to be building a self-storage facility. But you basically use the same principles to analyze the value of a store if you're going to purchase one. Um, the way we're going to go through this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on all of the slides. I'm just going to hit the highlights because I know that the, the viewers can come back and look at the slides if they want to check out the information a little bit more. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about what to consider when entering the self-storage business. When I have uh, talked to people that are just starting out, I'll just make sure that, that slide transitions. When I've talked to people who are just starting out in the industry, uh, it's mostly been at trade shows. And at trade shows, there can be thousands of attendees and hundreds of visitors. And I've talked to people that have done a lot of research because they're very, very interested in doing this right. But the problem that they have isn't that there's a lack of information, it's that, that the information that they get is overwhelming and confusing and sometimes it's contradictory. And they say, I really just don't know where to start. So my purpose in this discussion today is to try and help get rid of that deer in the headlights look that I have seen by just going over the overall perspective of self-storage as a business. I want to talk about who the participants are and what their responsibilities are and the different studies and reports that people talk about all the time to just kind of define what they actually are. I'm going to approach it just kind of in an A to Z method, uh, making it as simply as possible to just follow the steps through in self-storage. The principal participants in a self-storage project are the owner, the developer, the financer, and the manager. So we'll start at the top with the owner. The owner of our project needs to answer three basic questions for themselves. What do I need to know? Who can I get help from? And how will we interact? The first thing that you have to know about self-storage is that it is a business. 
And that sounds really, really simplistic. But lots of times people get into self-storage for an emotional reason as well as for a business reason. It's just the nature of self-storage being different. But you have to evaluate whether or not this is going to be a good business before anything else comes into play. The second thing that you need to remember, in self-storage, people will only rent what they need. And that's different from other businesses. If your garage is empty or you're not moving, there is no inducement, no incentive that anybody can have that's going to get you to go out and rent a storage space. So there really has to be a need for people to use this product. Next, you have to remember that what your product is, is actually just airspace, nothing else. You can uh, package it in different ways by having a nice outside appearance or changing the sizes and shapes of the units. But your product is airspace. Because your product is airspace, presentation is everything. So keeping those business fundamentals in mind, let's look at what the owner is trying to achieve, what the owner's objectives are. How much personal participation do you want to have in putting this project together? What financial commitment do you want to make? What time commitment are you prepared to make? And how are you going to go about deciding who you want to have on your team? The most common reasons that people have talked to me about when we're talking about self-storage, uh, first of all, oftentimes they just have land. They've inherited it or it's been in the family for a long time. They have land and they've decided that they want to put it to some good use. Secondly, people look at it as a simple business. I mean, compared to a grocery store, it's a very simple business. And they're looking for something that is simple. Also, self-storage is one of the few types of businesses where you can have a residence at the location of the business. And people oftentimes are interested in that. They want to have a, a combination retirement place business or something like that, place to put their mother-in-law, whatever. And then the last reason, of course, is that historically, real estate investments have had a very good ROI. Compared to other types of real estate, they've done very well. So if you have in mind what your goals want to be, the next thing you have to consider is how do you want to actually participate in bringing these goals to life? You have ownership options. And the type of ownership that you take in the property uh, or in the project as it is developing is going to dictate the level of participation that you have. So basically, there's two types of, of investing in a real estate project like this. You can invest as a participating party or a non-participating party. If you're a participating party, that would be like you as the individual being the owner of the property. You can also go into partnership with other people in which you would still have a participating interest. Or you could do what's called a joint venture, and typically that's when the owner of the property uh, joins up with the developer and they do the project together. In all of those cases, you actually have some input on the decisions that are being made. In a non-participating investment, it's just that. It's an investment. You don't really say what's going to happen. You just participate in the economics of it. When you've decided uh, what your participation is going to be, that has uh, an effect on the financial commitment that you want to make. And you can look at the financial commitment first to decide what kind of participation you want to have. But they go hand in hand. And when you're thinking about your financial commitment, you need to think about your personal ability to meet whatever the loan requirements might be. You need to consider the processes that you're going to use to evaluate the cost and income potential of your investment. Tax burden is very, very important. You have to take that into consideration. Most small businesses that fail within the first few years do so because they don't understand the taxes. Personal taxes and business taxes are completely different animals. And it is a big financial commitment that you have to understand. So are liabilities and, or, and insurance. Those are big expenses. And you have to consider whether or not you have the resources to handle the unexpected. We had an endangered turtle species in Florida that you know, showed up on the land, and it turned out to be extremely expensive. The time commitment is something that starts early when you're first going into the research and can continue for a considerable period of time. 
the entitlements process is one of the most lengthy processes, or can be, and by entitlements I mean getting all the government approvals for everything that you need to do. And depending upon where the property is located, that can be a short time period or a long time period. There's time involved in purchasing the land. There's time involved in construction. I mean, it could be six to eight months or even longer, depending on the size of the project. Some of these arrows are in red and some of them are in green. And that's because the red arrows are all money going out. You don't start making any money until you get your certificate of occupancy, which you spent all of this time and all of this money up to that point. You start making money when you get your certificate of occupancy, but what you start with is an empty store. So you have the facility, you have the expenses you've incurred to date, but it takes a matter of time in order to get enough income to cover your current expenses, and that's what's called your lease carry time period. Lease carry means that you're still using some of the money you borrowed from your construction loan, but you are getting additional income from rental units. Once you have enough income from rental units to cover all of your expenses, that's called your break-even point. And then after that is when it starts becoming profitable. But that's a considerable time commitment from when you start doing your research to when you start actually getting money. The last thing that I want to talk about is putting your team together. You have to do considerable due diligence in selecting your team. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this from a vendor perspective because that's what I am. And we all want your business. We all want to put our best foot forward and show you everything that we can do. But the truth is that each one of us actually has different areas of expertise. And facts are a matter of presentation. So what you have to do is you have to understand the basics of the language that vendors are going to be talking and construction so that you can be sure you're getting the services that you really want. There's really only two ways that vendors can differentiate themselves either by the product or by their experience. And in self-storage products really are pretty similar. So we talk a lot about experience. Now I said that facts are a matter of presentation and that's really kind of an odd thing to say because you think facts are facts. So I want to just give you this little example about understanding number facts. If you started out with a site that was uh, just a little less than five acres, say 200,000 square feet, Part of that would be use, not usable land, uh, like a floodplain or uh, there's lots of different reasons you can't use all the land. But you subtract out that unusable land and then you subtract out the amount of land that you would have to use for paving and landscaping and you might be left with say 90,000 square feet, of which your buildings would probably cover 60,000 square feet. But the whole building size is not really what the banks are going to look at because they're going to be looking at the net leasable, which is the number of square feet that you can actually charge money for. So what we have is a lot of different facts that you can discuss in a lot of different ways. And there's no law about how they are presented. So you have to understand these different terms that people are using, because there's a big difference between saying I have experience building 200,000 square feet on this size and experience saying I have 52,000 square feet on this size. And actually, uh, what construction people usually use is the gross square footage. That's the footprint of the building. But you just need to be able to talk to people. And the same thing is true about the services that are offered. Um, development is an area that covers uh, a wide range of different applications. And uh, recently, in the last few years, when I say recently, a lot of metal buildings have expanded into development services. And there are also people who have never actually built a project at all, but they offer services like market analysis and investment and feasibility studies. And these people can all say that they do development, but what they are actually doing is a section or a part of the whole development process. So you need to understand what the whole development process is in order to be able to speak to them effectively about what services you're actually going to buy. Building relationships with your vendors is important. 
honest people have honest misunderstand honorable people, excuse me, have honest misunderstandings. So when you're talking to people, don't think that they're trying to deceive you in any way. It's just that they're looking at it from their perspective of what they offer, and you're looking at it from your perspective of what you're looking for. That's why you have to identify it exactly what it is before you start buying. And you have to use contracts. Because what contracts do is confirm that both parties have the same understanding of exactly the type of commitment that they're making. So you have to investigate the details so that you can trust in your team. And you have to be able to trust in your team because your team is going to have knowledge that you don't have and you have to have faith that they're giving you good advice. The next question you need to ask is, who am I going to get help from? In answering that question, the first thing I'd like to do is define kind of the circle of activity that takes place as far as who are the participants in creating a successful self-storage. And we're going to go over a little bit who, what each of these different participants do. We'll start with an overview of what the developer does. Their first important activity is that they determine whether or not the place that you want to put your facility is actually a viable location. The second thing that they do is that they, they design the project so that it's the most profitable. They give you financial estimates of what all of the costs are going to be, and then when it's time to actually build the building, they oversee the construction. And the development duties can be handled in a number of different ways. The owner can be the developer themselves. They can have a joint mid venture, uh, as I mentioned earlier, where the developer and the owner work together. Or you can just hire the services of a third party, and they develop the project independently based on what you've told them that your goals are. The financer for the project ah. provides project funding. They also inspect the project as it is going along. They actually physically go out there to the site and look at the progress that is being made to be sure that the payments that they are releasing are commensurate with what's actually being built. The last thing that they do is review all of the documentation with regard to the project to make sure that their loan and the owner's interest are being safeguarded. There's two basic types of funding, private and institutional. And uh, on a project, usually there are investors as well as financial um, funding from a, from, a, uh, from a bank. The manager overview is, uh, consists of marketing, startup procedures, operations, maintenance, and accounting. The owner can be the manager, the owner can hire an employee to be the manager, or they can again contract for third party managing. Now that we've talked about these different people and what they provide, the last ownership question is how will we interact with each other? How you interact with your team depends partly on the participation level that you have decided upon. If you are going to get a loan with a finance company, the interaction that you are going to have is going to be based on the loan documents. That is your contract with the bank. With the developer, you will have a contract that will define what their development services are going to be with you. And for the manager, you will also have a contract. We're going to go forward now talking about these individuals in a little bit more depth, and we'll start with the financer. The financer looks at the investment exactly the same way that you do. You are going to determine for yourself if this is going to be a profitable investment, and so is the person who's considering financing. If it's a good project, they're going to provide the financing for you. Then they're going to inspect the work as it goes forward, and they're going to distribute the funds to you to pay for that work. And the last thing that they do is protect you, the owner, by the documentation that they require. The next thing we're going to talk about is the developer. And the developer has many different duties. 
and they are an extremely important part of your entire project. The developer's three main focuses are analysis of the project, design of the project, and then the actual construction itself. Now they can perform these duties themselves or they can subcontract these duties out to others so that they get the most expertise available in that particular area. We're going to talk about the analysis that the developer does first and we're going to start with site analysis. Basically there's three types of analysis and then there's an analysis summary. On site analysis, what you are looking at is the actual land itself. You're looking at the jurisdictional requirements that apply to the land and you're looking at the physical condition of the land. Anything that may affect the land and the use of the land is part of the site analysis. The next thing that we are going to look at is a market analysis. Market analysis uh, is something that you will hear a lot of people talk about. There are a wide variety of services involved in market analysis. So I want to go over them one at a time so that you understand what each different type of analysis provides for you because these terms get thrown around a lot. We're going to start with a supply and demand. Okay. Now remembering that your only product is airspace and that there has to be a need for it, the first thing you have to look at is how many, service, how many uh, providers of the same service are already in that area and how does that number of square feet that are available in that area compare to the population. What you're trying to determine is whether or not if you put your store there, will there be people to rent what you are providing. So if there are, say, five stores within a three-mile radius and you talk to those store owners or, or find out whatever way you can, that they're only 70% occupied, that is pretty much of a clue that you should stop right there and not spend any more money because this facility isn't going to work. On the other hand, if you're in an urban market and there's 100,000 square feet, uh, 100,000 people within a five mile radius and there's only one self storage, that is a really good indicator that this is probably going to be a success. And what you do from your supply and demand is say, okay, should I go forward to the next study? And let's assume we've got a good location and we do, we go forward to the next study. We've already found out what competitors are around us just to know if we should go forward. But then you have to analyze each one of those competitors individually. Because what you are going to have to offer has to be equal to or better than what they offer. And you can't know what that is until you've gone out there and made an organized, objective study of what it is that they offer. And what you find out is going to have an effect on the type of facility that you design and how much it's going to cost you to build it. Once you've looked at the, uh, at the competitor side of it, you need to look at the people side of it. And that's called the demographic analysis. That's looking at the people in your area. And studies show that people with different characteristics rent different types of units. Um, for instance, uh, apartment dwellers and students, they're used to living in small spaces and they'll be very happy with a small unit. If your customer base has a lot of older homeowners, they have more stuff and they're going to want to rent larger units. And your only product is airspace, so you have to package it in the way that's going to be the most appealing for all of the people that are around you. And that's why the demographic analysis is very important. The other thing that you have to remember is that you make more money on smaller units than you do on larger units on a per square foot basis. And remember what the banks look at? They look at the net leasable square feet. So the banks are interested in that demographic, well they're interested in the results of the demographic analysis and what your unit mix is going to be. The next type of study that we're looking at is trade areas. When we're talking about target markets or trade areas, basically it's divided into three different types of categories. 
there's what they call a primary market, which is a dense population, say 100,000 people within about three miles. There's a secondary market that would be like an urban market, maybe 80,000 people within five miles, and a rural market, and that would be, say, 30,000 people within seven miles. And the reason that we need to look at this is because people in dense markets don't want to drive very far because the traffic is a hassle. I mean, that's the bottom line. People who are in rural markets will be driving a lot farther because they're, using, they're used to having to drive farther to get services. So you're trying to figure out where you're going to draw people from and you need to understand the density of the population around your area and what that means to your business. One other thing that can affect your marketplace is traffic generators, and that those are factors that are outside your actual trade area, but that can increase traffic that is just going past your store. Um, and it needs to be something that people go to on a routine basis, because self-storage is a business of convenience. So if the self-storage is on the way to schools, on the way to churches, on the way to big businesses like Walmart or grocery stores, or on the way to major attractions. Now, the major attractions isn't because of the people who come for vacation. It's because of all of the people that work there and all the suppliers and all the vendors that are going to be driving past your location. So you take all of these things into consideration for anything that may increase the volume that's coming past your store. Next, we're going to look at the jurisdictional and code compliance. Um, this can get you financially. Oops, I skipped past that one. Let me go back one. Uh, jurisdictional and code compliance is important because you have to find out everything that is going to affect the cost of building your facility before you get started. And there are local requirements that tell you what your facility has to look like, whether or not you have to put in a bike path or a deceleration zone lane. Um, just there's a myriad of, of things that can affect the cost of your project. So you do a jurisdictional and code compliance study to decide whether or not it's going to be economically feasible for you to go ahead and go forward. And I have to tell you, all of these sciences are part art and part science. A lot of it is based on observation, project knowledge, and statistical facts. There really aren't any absolutes, but they are essential in going forward in figuring out the economic feasible of what your project is, of whether or not your project is economically feasible. And all that means is, is this a good investment? You have to figure out what your expenses are, what your income is, what the future is likely to be for your project, and what the value of your asset is going to be once the project is built. All of that is part of the economic feasibility. These reports that paint the financial picture of your project can be very complicated and have a great deal of information in them. And there are a lot of resources for you to go back and look at what each one of these different reports presents to you. But I'll look at one regarding income and one regarding expenses. For the income, let's look at a unit mix and uh, rent summary. The unit mix and rent summary basically tells you if you build this number of units, at this price, what is your total monthly income going to be, and what are your annual rents going to be? You do that for each type of unit that you're going to have on your facility. And you just have to make some assumptions. And these are numbers that you can play with to try and figure out how many of which different types of units you want to build. But you make up a summary like this for your climate control, your non-climate control, humidity, whatever you want to offer, you put down on paper and figure out how much income that is actually going to generate for you. On the opposite side of that, you have all of your expenses. And there are a lot more different types of expenses than there is unit income <laughs> or, or income. Um, 
you put these, these are some of the elements that you would put into an estimate of development cost. Your land construction, design management, all your legal costs, insurance, all of these different things are put together and investigated individually. Once you've investigated what those costs are individually, you put them together on a report that's called a statement of development costs. Once you have the statement of development costs, you have an idea of what the project is going to cost to develop compared to that unit mix and income summary that you did to know how much money you're going to make to pay off all of these development costs that you have um, calculated out in a variety of different ways. When that is done, you put it all together, all of your reports, all of your economic and, uh, uh, feasibility studies together in one report that's called an investment summary. And this investment summary should give you all of the information that you need to go forward on the project. It should tell you if this project will or will not make money. And this needs to be done before you turn over the first shovel. Uh, people who are interested in self-storage oftentimes go forward without actually doing the analysis. And you need to know what your goals are, what this project is going to cost you, how much profit you can make, and then decide, does that investment meet what your personal goals were? Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to meet your personal goals. All of that is under the analysis section of the development responsibilities. The next thing we talk about is the design. There are three basic co uh, components in design. That's the site plan and unit mix, the construction plans, and the rendering. Now you have to work with the site plan and unit mix in order to come up with some of the projections that you need for the economic feasibility. But once you get to the point where you're actually building the project, then the design phase begins in earnest. Now the purpose of the site plan and unit mix is to get uh, the most bang for your buck, really. You design your site so that it is going to have uh, the best features for your customer, so that they will want to rent there, so that it takes up absolutely every square footage of space that you can get, that you can generate money on, and so that it will be appealing to the public. And then on the unit mix side, what you are trying to do is design the facility that's going to make you the most money for the population that you have. We talked about that uh, income and unit mix summary that shows all of the different types of units. And we talked about the fact that you make more money on smaller units than you do on larger units. And we talked about the fact that you have to please the demographics of your area. All of these things are why the site plan and unit mix are so very, very important. Once that has been finished, you actually get into the construction plan phase of the project. And you have a team that puts the construction plans and follows through on the construction for you. The team is the architect, the civil engineer, the structural engineer, the mechanical engineer, and the landscape design professional. Depending upon your long, uh, location, you don't always have to have a uh, landscape component, but more and more often you do. The architect is the person that has ultimate responsibility for the project, for all of the other engineers and people that you will be using. They do the site plan and unit mix, and they also provide certain of the physical construction plans themselves. The person that does the first work on the project that works for the architect is the civil engineer. And what the civil engineer is responsible for is everything with regard to the land and the utilities, but not the buildings. They are responsible for anything that is underground and the ground itself, but nothing above the ground. That's why you hear, when you hear people talking about costs and talking about slab and above, that's what they mean. Things that are not affected 
under the uh, civil engineers portion of the project, but only the things above the ground. The structural engineer is responsible for the design of the building so that it meets all of the building codes. And he's the person who makes sure that your building is safe. Uh, nearly everyone now is going to the International Building Code uh, for building specifications. But there are always also local codes that are going to have to be taken into consideration. And it's the structural engineer's job to specify the different types of materials and strengths and compositions of materials that you're going to have to use in order to make your building safe. The mechanical engineers are responsible for the HVAC, electrical, and plumbing. And of those, uh, you'll probably have the most interaction with the HVAC guy because the physical location of your property, if it's in Minnesota or Arizona, is going to have a big impact on the type of HVAC that you're going to be using. So there's more variation in what that mechanical engineer does than what any of the other mechanical engineers do. And then the last person that comes in is uh, the landscaping person. And they are primarily responsible for code compliance. There are more and more and more codes all the time regarding landscaping and appearance. They are also the person who is going to have the initial impact on the curb appeal of your facility. Curb appeal is extremely important. And the one thing that I would like to emphasize is that you should really use natural plants or, or plants that are native to your area because they long-term upkeep, that's just the best way to go, is using what's native to your area. The last thing I want to talk about are the renderings. And the renderings are prepared by the architects. And what they are is a visual representation of what the project is going to look like once it's completed. If you don't have a rendering or a visible, uh, visible representation of your project, it's left up to every individual's mind what that project is going to look like. And if you just think of the term self-storage, you can envision, envision in your own mind both ends of the spectrum on what a self-storage project could look like. So that's why the rendering is important. You need to take it to uh, the local, whatever the local government authorities are that are going to be approving your project. And oftentimes, you have to be able to take it to the people in your neighborhood because they are going to have some say on whether or not this project goes forward. And the rendering is what you use to tell them what your project is really going to be. The final area of, de of development responsibilities is construction. Uh, oftentimes, when people are first getting into, uh, into self-storage, that's the first thing they think about is the construction. But it's really the third part of the development process. In, in construction, financial accountability, time management, and project management all have weight. They are all going forward at the same time. And they all affect how much this project is going to cost you to build. We'll start with financial accountability. And that actually begins with a systematic plan review of that first site plan and unit mix for cost efficiency. People that have a lot of experience in cell storage can look at a site plan and they can tweak it so that it's going to cost you less or make you more money. The next thing in financial accountability is that they have to put together all of the estimates and budgets for the project. Then they buy out the materials, do the job cost accounting, et cetera, et cetera, uh, handle all the payments. But the financial accountability starts at the very beginning of the project, not just when you start paying bills. Another financial requirement is the protection of uh, the owner's investment by the appropriate documentation. You have to keep track of lien releases. You have to keep track of the insurance for everyone that works on the project. You need to know who the suppliers are, because they can file a lien, even if you haven't ever heard of them. And you have to, again, always be aware of what the tax implications are. In time management, remember where the clock starts ticking? It starts 
ticking financially way back in that research element and you don't actually start making any money until you have your certificate of occupancy. So time is money, and the clock starts ticking when the first dollar is spent. The most important thing in time management on a project uh, oftentimes is getting through the approval process. The approval process, as I mentioned, can be very long. And it's easy for something to get shuffled to the side and it is part of the contractor's responsibility if they are assisting you in that approvals process to make sure that everything is followed up all the way through and that your project is getting approved as quickly as possible. The second factor is the actual construction management. A number of different things are all going on at the same time and they're all going on in sequence. And you have to have a construction management program to keep track of everything and make sure that the trades and the inspections are all being followed through with as quickly as possible. The final aspect of construction is actual project management, and that's the real building of the project itself. Your general contractor is your project manager, and they can do the work themselves or they can subcontract some or all of that work out to other people who have individual areas of expertise. But the responsibility for what is built remains with the general contractor. No matter who else they use, the general contractor is responsible for whatever other services they may contract for. Even though self-storage is comparatively simple construction, there are a number of different trades that are involved in actually getting the job done. They all have to be effectively coordinated. They usually, most of them have to be working at the same time, and they all have to be working in sequence with each other. And that's what the project manager does. Keeps all of these balls in the air at the same time, doesn't let any of them fall, and you get finished with your project as quickly as you possibly can. Once the project is finished, that's when the manager takes over. I cannot overemphasize the importance of the manager. People put property in storage only if it is important to them in one way or another. It's an extension of themselves or an extension of their business. They are entrusting it to the manager's care. And it's usually not by choice. It's usually because of some circumstance in their life that forces them to go outside their own little comfort zone and put their stuff with someone else. That's why your management is so important. And I want to talk about the seven functions that managers perform so that you'll have an idea of all of the things that they are going to be taking care of for you. The most important thing for a new store startup is organization. There are, you can have a 10 page list of everything that you have to do in order to get a store ready to open. Um, you have to start a few months before the store actually opens because you're going to have to schedule your utilities, you're going to have to schedule your telephone, you're going to have to select your, uh, your operating system. The startup for the facility includes everything from pre-marketing to toilet paper. It really does. And organization is the most important part of getting ready to start your store. Once your store is ready to go, you are ready to open the doors, you are talking about the people that are going to be handling the property for you. The single most important thing in the success of your business are the people behind the counter. No matter how nice your facility is, it's the person behind the counter that makes the sale. Uh, my slide isn't forwarding. There we go. Okay. It is the person behind the counter that makes the sale. Um, I, I, I want to make this point clearly and, and I'll just I'll just be blunt about it, okay? Um, people will only hand over their precious stuff to somebody that seems like they actually know what they're doing and are competent and somebody that doesn't act like a jerk. If you don't have a good person behind the counter, they're not going to want to trust you with your stuff. 
marketing begins before the store actually even opens. And marketing continues throughout the life of the project. You've heard it said that the only constant in life is that life changes. Well, the same thing is true of your marketing plan. It's not something that you go out and do once and then you think it's done. It has to evolve as the market around you evolves. The next thing that you have to prepare are your product sales and services, which involves selecting the retail items, putting up your displays, putting the sales procedures together, figuring out which of the ancillary services that you want to provide, if it's uh, trucks or post office boxes or whatever, which one of those are actually going to be profitable for you. Because you can invest a lot of money in something, but you need to have a good feeling of confidence up front that that's something that's going to be making you money. On the operating side, what operations covers is they cover the generating of the income, keeping a good business relationship with your customers and providing them good service, and taking care of the property. Those are the three things involved in operating your facility efficiently and well. The next thing that you have to always keep in mind is tracking the financial side, and that's the accounting aspect of management. All accounting is is really just giving a financial picture of how the business is doing in standard report forms. And you use the standard forms because that's what the banks are going to look at, that's how you're going to prepare your taxes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And once again, we need to think about the language of self-storage because in this little example that we have of unit statistics, you can talk about occupancy in three different ways. You can talk about the percentage of units occupied, you can talk about the number of units occupied, and you can talk about the square footage of units occupied. And that can be three different numbers. But what your bank is going to be interested in is your square footage of occupancy. The final component for management is auditing. And there are three types of auditing. There's financial auditing, procedural auditing, and operational auditing. Financial auditing, that's just making sure that the numbers that you're given are the right numbers. Procedural auditing is how things are being done. Operational auditing is what is being done. And you need to have a routine, organized manner of following through on all three of these different types of making sure that there are no problems that are coming up at your facility without you know about without you knowing about them. So when we have gone through these different elements of what to consider with when you're entering self storage, the first thing really is just begin at the be begin at the beginning. Get a clear picture of what you want your self-storage project to be. You decide what you personally want to achieve and what you want others to do for you. My slides are a little slow because they're so large, but what I'm doing is I'm just following through on a project to show you the progression because the way the, the facility progresses is very similar to the way that you have to begin your study of self-storage and follow through on a step-by-step -step basis to get to the goal that you have set for yourself in the beginning. This is the facility that we did in Florida. It was called our Landstar location. And it's really fun to watch as, this, as the facility takes shape. And that's something that I look forward to for each of you. Building a facility is a big job. There's a lot involved. But when you get to that point that you can look at what you've built, when you can open the doors, and you can have your own business, that's what makes it all worthwhile. That's your store. Thank you very much for allowing me to spend this time with you today. I hope it's been helpful. Okay, we now have uh, some questions that have come in during the webinar. 
The first question is, are there some standard form contracts available for self-storage? Yes. Uh, it, in Texas, for instance, there's a, a very active uh, association called the uh, Texas Self-Storage Association, and they provide contracts that are specifically for Texas. So the first place I would look are uh, the state organizations for self-storage, because they usually have a contract specifically for this business. Okay, next question is, is there a ratio of population to available rental space that would make a site feasible? It's different for every location. And Mini Storage Messenger publishes uh, an almanac that has uh, an analysis of different locations and their populations and the amount of self-storage that is likely to be available. That's a really good resource for finding that type of information. Okay, uh, next question is, should this, analysis, should this type of analysis be taken if I'm going to buy an existing facility? You really do need to look at the facility through the eyes of a new buyer because marketplaces change. Um, if the facility has been operating for a long time and it's, it's uh, you know, 90 percent occupied and it's been that way, maybe some of the analysis aren't uh, quite as critical. But the more you know, the better off you are. And the one thing that I would absolutely do in every case is the competition analysis. You need to know uh, what facilities are around you and what those facilities look like because your customers are going to be comparing you to them every single day. OK, great. Uh, Donna, the next question is, how should you pay your employees? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what the meaning is there, but that's well, the, the one thing that I can say is that whatever you pay your employees, how you pay your employees has to be traceable as far as the paper trail. But I think what the question may be uh, regarding is, do you give them wages or do you give them bonuses or you know, is it on like a per unit basis? And really that's, that's a personal choice uh, and it depends on your marketplace. I would see what, how they're being paid uh, on because you're competing for employees the same way you're competing for customers if you're looking for good ones. And you need to have an idea how the other people around you are paying their employees because you'll probably want to offer something similar as far as a package. OK. Uh, where can I get population or demographic information? Again, the almanac from the uh, Mini Stories Messenger is an excellent source. And there, there really are uh, a lot of places that you can get that type of information. Uh, first place I would start is with the city or the Better Business Bureau. They are always trying to entice businesses to come to their location. So they're going to have a lot of information readily available for you that they've already put together. Uh, you can get information on the web. There, there are really a number of resources once you start looking. One thing that I would say is that postal counts are more accurate than census counts. And the reason for that is because a lot of people have more than one residence, and a census only counts one residence. That's particularly true in a place like Florida, where people would live someplace else on the East Coast, but they spend a lot of time in Florida. So they're actually people that may be very likely to rent from you, but their main uh, residents is someplace else, so they're not counted in the census, but they do have an address, and they are counted in the postal counts. Wonderful. Uh, next question, I'm looking to purchase existing self-storage properties instead of building. What is the best way to acquire funding? Oh, funding is a question that I cannot answer you in know, this market right I, now. I, <laughs> I would love to be able to answer that question. But I what was true six months ago no longer is. 
Absolutely. Um, one thing that I can suggest from, from our end is that we will be holding a webinar on May 20th um, that addresses self-storage loans in today's market and, and how to close such loans, and that's being uh, presented by Watermark Financial. So you can visit our website to sign up for that particular webinar if you are interested in getting more information on that. Um, next I will question. be signing up for that webinar. <laughs> I will be there too. <laughs> next question, Donna, is there a minimum number of units you should build in a facility? Really the only way you can determine uh, the minimum number of units is by whether or not the number of units that you're looking at is going to cover your costs. Uh, that's, that's really the only deciding factor, and everybody has different costs. If you already own your land, um, then you could build a, a smaller number of units because you don't have to have that much income generated in order to cover your costs. So the, really the balance in determining how many units you need is how many units it's going to take for you to make a profit. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, the last question we'll take today is, what is the biggest mistake that people make when designing or building a self-storage facility? I would say is that when people start thinking about self-storage, the very first thing they, they think about is how much is the construction going to cost. And what they really should be thinking about is whether or not this is a location that the business will work. Great. Um, you mentioned cost. Can you give um, listeners some idea of how much it does cost to build a self-storage facility? Uh, the one thing that you can never really talk about uh, until you're actually talking about a site is what all of the uh, land type costs are for the excavation and bringing in utilities and things of that nature. You can never really put a price on that. For slab and above costs, um, it depends somewhat on the location of the country and quite a bit on all of the different fees that the city is going to impose upon you in order to have a facility there. But, you know, brass tax, 35 to $45 a square foot for the entire facility, and, and excluding the things I just mentioned, and maybe 12 to $15 a square foot for just the metal building portion that I do. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, Donna, thank you for giving us such a great presentation. We hope that this has provided useful information to assist you in your investment or development endeavors in the self-storage industry. You will be receiving an email by Monday with a link to the archived presentation and a very special offer for the 2009 Development Handbook. So please make sure you watch your inbox for this email. And again, uh, you can visit our website at ministoragemessenger.com for information about upcoming webinars. Our uh, next webinar will be on May 20th, sponsored by Watermark Financial. The topic is Closing Self-Storage Loans in Today's Market. Uh, once again, thank you, Donna, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the day.